Hey, thanks for stopping by. Not only is she a lady in your head who calls you Stud Muffin, Ayo is a vital bridge to understanding the true nature of Ko. In the community, there's been a debate about who or what exactly Ayo was. Was Ayo a flesh and blood human who was killed in the fires of Ibis, or was she always Ko? Now, we do know that Ayo calls herself a Rubiconian. In her own words, The Coral. It's my family. My brothers and sisters. I am but a single wave. Born from the Coral Tide. A Rubiconian without a body. More specifically, Ao is called a Sea Wave mutation by Allmind in the final boss fight, while a data log on the alternative Attack the Watchpoint mission also says that it detected a mutation, and that detection is the same as Ao's emblem. So I think it's fair to assume that wave mutations are a proxy for cold consciousness. Yet according to the data logs from Professor Nanai, he decided to deploy the fires of Ibis after he detected a mutation. It is mutations such as these that will bring about a collapse that humanity has no hope of controlling. In other words, as the coal was becoming more aware, the professor decided to kill it. Now, this is speculation, but I think everyone who died in the fires of Ibis merged with the coal, and then afterwards, this swarm intelligence started to take on human attributes, including the ability to communicate. Consider Father Dormayan, the leader of the Rubicon Liberation Front, and one of the very few characters who has made contact. I know you menace. You can see them too. The voices. Just as I once did. The records state that Dormayan was a dozer in his younger days. Perhaps he experienced mind-altering effects not unlike the contact we share. Yet it sounds like Dormayan only started to hear Seria's voice after the fires of Ibis. In the fire's aftermath, he developed an ardent belief in symbiosis with the coal. And in his first writing, he describes Rubicon as frail and withered, a description that would best suit the planet after such a massive calamity. Returning to Ayo, she does seem to have some very human traits, so I don't think she's completely alien either. She is very compassionate. Not only is she horrified at what the Institute did to her brothers and sisters, they were using coal for fuel. She also regrets the loss of human life and that we have to kill Carla and Walter to liberate Rubicon. I understand how you feel about betraying Walter's last wishes and taking on Carla. But still, I want you to give me a chance. I'm not asking Walter's Hound, but Raven, the independent mercenary. But there's a sillier side to Ayo as well. In the New Game Plus Plus cycle, she even pranks 621 by impersonating Allmind. Callsign, Raven, your records have been updated. Sorry, Raven. It's just me. And during the Xylem survey mission, she says this. It's been a long time since we've been on a mission together without Walter. The control device isn't going anywhere. Take your time, Raven. To me, that implies that she enjoys and prefers spending time with the game's okayest lobotomite without Walter getting in the way. Whether we should count that as a date, I'll leave to Reddit and Rule 34. In any case, it should be clear that coal has biological components. This is why the human Rubiconians use it to raise their mealworms. And those mealworms seem to be their main source of sustenance. The coral wells are the Rubiconians' lifeline. The Rubiconians literally live in pods and eat bugs, and it doesn't seem to take much coal to have these effects. Father Dormayan calls coal Rubicon's blessing. Just a single drop grants us our flesh and blood. And this also seems to be backed up by the ravings of dozers. Now, this is speculation, but I wonder if the dozers were also able to make contact. This would let them commune with the swarm intelligence of coal, which could in turn explain how they came up with their ideas. And hearing the voices of a vast alien intelligence could even explain why Rummy would think he's a demigod and... Fucking invincible! In addition, the game heavily implies 
that coal can extend human lifespans. We first come across this idea through Kola, who calls herself a cinder or a survivor of the fires of Ibis. But that cataclysm happened more than half a century before the game started. And as we learn from a Coyote Chatter data log, Kala doesn't look like she's in her 70s or 80s. She's got the nerve to call herself a freaking cinder. Nice try lady, but you're a little young for that stolen valor. But Kala isn't the only AC pilot we fight who lived before the fires of Ibis. According to his arena bio, Sula was part of the very first generation of coal augmented pilots and was active in the star system surrounding Rubicon before the fires of Ibis. And in his NG++ mission, a datalog calls Sula an aging mercenary. Then there's Father Dormayan, who also survived the fires of Ibis. Not only that, he's the fourth best pilot in the arena and can one-shot the filter copter. Now, if Cole can slow aging, that would provide another powerful motivation for why people are so determined to keep fighting for Rubicon. Speaking of fighting, I'll close this video by talking about the Rubicon Liberation Front's ace pilot in the hole, Rusty. I would do anything for you! When we first meet him, he's a Vesper squad leader working for Archibus. And according to his arena bio, Rusty was selected to join the upper echelons of the Vespers in less than half a year. But if you do the Liberator of Rubicon path, you find out that Rusty has actually been a double agent all this time, covertly working for the RLF. I hate to say it, but Rubicon still needs me. So, buddy, who needs you? There's no braver threat than power with a purpose. While Rusty is obviously an awesome pilot, there's another explanation for why he took off so quickly in the Vespers. According to the arena bio for Uncle Flatwell, the de facto leader of the RLF, Flatwell worked as a spy within the extraplanetary corporations and has sway over a rather significant contact in Schneider's HR department. And Rusty was headhunted by Schneider, an Orcubus affiliate. There's also a subtle visual detail. While working undercover at Orcubus, Rusty's emblem has a muzzle, but when you fight Rusty in his final form as Steel Haze Ortus, the muzzle is no longer there. Now, you may have noticed I didn't talk at all about one of the game's most important characters, Walter. Well, that's because I did an entire lore deep dive on everyone's favorite high school chemistry teacher, which you can watch here. Thank you so much for watching. I'd love to see what Yens think about Air, Rusty, or the Rubiconians in general. And I also want to give a special thanks to everyone who's joined my Patreon since I started doing this. So uh, thank you to Azdaza and Chris S. And if you'd like your own form of digital immortality, you can support me on Patreon or through YouTube membership.